Many of you know me personally, but if you don't, an interesting fact about me is that I worked for about five years at the Oklahoma City Zoo in the aquatics department. And uh, just growing up, I've always been fascinated by aquariums and fish tanks. Every time I see an aquarium in the doctor's office or at somebody's home, I want to go and I want to look at it. And you know, a fish tank invites inquiry. You know somebody set it up, they've stocked it, they've furnished it with plants, and you just want to go up and you want to look at it. And the nature of a fish tank is that you can look at it from every angle. There's nothing hidden inside it. And in fact, if you look a little closely, you might see a little scum, a little algae built up in the corner there that somebody's forgotten to clean. There's no hiding in a fish tank. And in fact, it's given rise to a phrase that we use in English, in the fishbowl. Maybe you work a fishbowl job. You feel like you're in the fishbowl at your job. It means people are scrutinizing and investigating your work and perhaps criticizing it. Well, friends, I want you to know that living as a Christian is a fishbowl job. It always has been. You think back to Daniel in the Old Testament who had critis, critics and detractors, and what did they do? They camped out under his window trying to find something to pin on him. And all they found was that he prayed three times a day. Even Jesus had detractors who uh, looked for something to accuse him of. And the same is true of us today. So I want to think and study this morning about how do you live in the fishbowl as a Christian? How do you live under scrutiny? And I want to take my thoughts from the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. Now what you need to know about 1 Peter is it is a letter written to Christians who are experiencing persecution for their faith. Because of their faith, they have been scattered abroad. And so there's an interesting dichotomy in 1 Peter of these people who are chosen. They are God's people. They are saints. And yet they're exiles. They are pilgrims. And so 1 Peter begins with encouragement to these people. There's a beautiful section in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, where uh, Peter draws from the language of the Old Testament prophets to remind these Christians of their identity in Christ. And he concludes in verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Now that's amazing. But it might lead somebody to have the wrong idea about their identity. It might lead somebody to conclude, why should I care about what the people in the world think of me? Isn't it just between me and God? I'm one of God's people. Peter's going to address that here in verses 11 through 17. Starting in verse 11, Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. We understand the illustration of a pilgrim or an exile. That is somebody who is on their way to another destination, but the place they are at currently is not it. That's not their home. And so they may be there temporarily, but they're going to be moving on. That's true of Christians. We are on our way to another home. We're on our way to the new Jerusalem. To be at home with God. And we are traveling through this world, but it's not our home. We're only here temporarily. And you know, this land is God's land in the sense he created it, but it's been taken over by Satan. And so it's a hostile place to be for a Christian. And so we are encouraged, as Peter says, to abstain from sinful desires or some translations say fleshly lusts that wage war against the soul. You inhabit a physical body here on this earth and you have fleshly appetites in your body. Now, usually we think of sexual temptation in this context, but really it could be the desire to eat, to drink, or to sleep. 
even your emotions and your, your impulses. These are not inherently evil. God created your body and he placed them within you. But he also placed a will in your body to control these impulses. And we are called to control ourselves with our mind. We have to be in control. The body doesn't naturally distinguish between what is right and wrong. We have to do that using the will God gave us. It's a war of sorts. You know, people talk about spiritual warfare, but this is the real spiritual warfare right here between your body and your soul to keep yourself pure. You have the choice to use your body to God's glory or to his shame. Now let's keep reading in verse 12. Peter says, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. This is why you've got to be in control because there are people in the world who don't have the same understanding that you do about spiritual things. Yet to them, this is the only home they know. As far as they're concerned, they're not going anywhere after this life. And so they look with confusion at you as a Christian. Sometimes that's very uncomfortable. And we feel that difference, the difference in values and in culture uh, between us and the world. And sometimes people of the world speak evil of us because of it. How are we to respond? We are to live righteously. We are to perform good works that God calls us to do so that when they look at us, just like Daniel, they won't be able to pin anything on us. They will see only good works and they will glorify God on the day he visits. Perhaps that's the day they obey the gospel. They realize God's way is the right way. Or perhaps that's the day of judgment when their eyes will be opened and they will see God's way is the right way. Now keep reading in verses 13 and 14. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. Now some people may get the idea, well, I'm a Christian. I am subject to nobody but God. The government can't tell me what to do. I'm subject to God. Friends, your reasoning is flawed, if that's your thinking. Because God has set the authorities in place. Now, he doesn't institute every single individual who's a ruler. He's done that from time to time. Uh, we can read about that in the Old Testament. But he has set the institution of government into place for a purpose. It's to keep the peace. It's to promote what is good and to punish those who are evil so Christians don't have to worry about that. And friends, within the sphere of the authority of the government, you have to be subject to them. Now we read of times when the lower authority of the government clashes with the higher authority of God in Acts and other places. And in those instances, Christians had remained subject to God. They simply had to say, we, we can't do that. We can't stop preaching Jesus. We can't worship the golden idol. But we must be a people in submission so that people of the world have nothing bad to say against us. I realize some people might say, if, if Peter had lived under my government, he wouldn't have written that. Well, friends, he lived under the government of Emperor Nero. And on the scale of kindness and tolerance for world rulers, Nero is very far down the list. He's quite possibly at the bottom. This applies to you. Because, verse 15, For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Friends, it's true we don't fit into this world. We are pilgrims on our way to a better place. But we have to fit into earthly societies and nations in some respect. We have to show people we are under authority. We are not 
rebellious. This is how you silence the ignorant criticisms people make of Christians. There's a lot of ignorant criticisms against Christians. I don't need to name them. I'm sure you have some on your mind right now. But friends, how do you put these criticisms to rest? Peter doesn't say silence the ignorance of foolish people by arguing with them on Facebook. Get in there and own the ignorant. Tell people how ignorant they really are. That's not what he says. He says, by your good behavior, you'll put them to rest. And so hopefully you've got your life right. And so when somebody comes along who is ignorant about Christ and starts to say, well, you know, those Christians, they're bigots and they hate women and this and that. Somebody who knows you is going to say, now, hang on, because I know him or I know her. And they've always cared for the poor. They've always been in submission to the government, even when it wasn't in their best interest. They paid their taxes. They've always showed love and compassion for people. What you're saying is not true. This is how we would put ignorant criticisms to rest. Read verse 16 with me. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but as God's slaves. Friends, we are at liberty to do a great many things as Christians, but we are not at liberty to sin. You need to get your life right, friend, before you go out there to save the lost, to seek and save them, as we've been talking about in this meeting. Get your life right. Get it squared away. If you need some ideas about what to work on, back up to the beginning of this chapter, chapter 2. You can read a little list there. We don't have freedom to sin. Scrub the algae out of the corners of the fishbowl before you invite people to come and look in. We also don't have freedom to go out of our way to offend people. We should never hold ourselves in a, in a self-righteous uh, position just because we're a Christian doesn't mean you get to ignore how other people think of you we need to be conscious of our personal interactions Romans 12 verse 18 I love this one says if possible as far as it depends on you live at peace with everyone we have an obligation to our fellow man and Peter summarizes our personal responsibility to others in verse 17. He says, honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. That's a great verse, friends. Write that one down. Put it on a post-it note on your door so you have to look at it every day before you go out there into the world. Ask yourself, first of all, am I doing these four things at all? Do I honor everyone? Do I have respect for everyone as a man or a woman created in God's image? Do I love my brothers and sisters in the faith? We need to cultivate love for our brothers and sisters. Friends, you can't have a brotherhood without kinship. You can't have kinship without association. We need to spend more time associating with our brothers and sisters so that we love them. Fear God. Have reverence and respect for what he says. And honor the emperor. Friends, just because our emperor is elected in this country doesn't mean you don't have to honor them. God says you do. We need to respect our rulers because they are fulfilling a purpose in God's plan. Friends, are you doing these things? If you are, are you doing them all the time? Every day of your life. Friends, people, to be honest with you, people today are very rarely converted from coming to a gospel meeting. They're very rarely converted from coming to a church service. What converts people in this world is when they look at you and they see the light of Christ shining out from within. Friends, you're living in the fishbowl. 
God's house is a glass house. When people look inside, what will they find? Thank you.